Hi, I'm Rich Dana, and welcome to the Summer Seminar Series. I'm coming to you from the reading room at Special Collections here on the third floor of the University of Iowa Main Library. And I'm here today to talk to you about an exhibit that I've curated. It's called Spirit Duplicators, Early 20th Century Copier Art, Fanzines and the Mimeograph Revolution. It's on display through July and August of this summer, 2021. You're welcome to come and visit in person, but if you can't make it up, I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. The title of this exhibit, Spirit Duplicators, Early 20th Century Copier Art, Fanzines, and the Mimeograph Revolution, probably brings up a number of questions for viewers. Um, some people may not be familiar with the terms spirit duplicator, mimeograph, copier art, or fanzines. Hopefully you'll learn a little bit about all of these things today. With this exhibit, I've drawn from across special collections to find examples of work that shows how artists and writers, when denied access to mainstream publishing take a DIY approach and use inexpensive copying or duplicating technologies when traditional publishing is not available to them. This could be because their ideas are revolutionary or radical uh, either politically or artistically or aesthetically uh, and what we find is that it doesn't matter whether artists are part of what's considered a more, quote, highbrow tradition, including the avant-garde who are embraced by art institutions and the academy, or whether we're talking about, quote, lowbrow artists like science fiction fans who are making fanzines uh, and talking about popular culture. Um, there is a common aesthetic that emerges when these artists use certain duplicating technologies and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. Let's start by talking about the mimeograph revolution. There's a great book called A Secret Location on the Lower East Side, Adventures in Writing, 1960 to 1980, in which authors Stephen Clay and Rodney Phillips write that, quote, from their apartments, garages, and basements, poets like Allen Ginsberg, Jack Spicer, Ted Berrigan, and Ann Waldman created their own publications as an alternative to the academic literary mainstream of the mid-20th century. These publications overflow with the enthusiastic experiments and explorations of such authors as Paul Oster, Clark Coolidge, Leroy Jones, better known as Amiri Baraka, Kenneth Koch, Eileen Miles, and Aram Soroyan. Also included are designs and original art by artists like Robert Rauschenberg, Andy Warhol, Joe Brainerd, and Alex Katz, who created covers and illustrations for the publications. The writers who created their own publications required cheap, accessible means of duplicating them. In many cases, they turned to the then prevalent mimeograph machine. Mimeograph allowed for immediate publication and distribution and was a primary tool of communication of communion among many poets and other writers of the 60s and 70s in what became known as the mimeograph revolution. Well this may beg the question what the heck is a mimeograph machine? The mimeograph machine uh, was a pre-Xerox, pre-digital duplicating device. It used a wax paper stencil uh, to print up to about 500 copies and it could be a hand crank device or it could be uh, powered by a motor uh, but the mimeograph wasn't the only uh, machine that was used to make these um, low-cost copies starting in the late 1800s a lot of people used what's called a hectograph it's um, a a tray of gelatin a glycerin uh, mixture sort of like uh, some of you may have done jelly prints um, 
monograph printing with acrylic paint and uh, a gelatin pad. Uh, it's very similar to that, except it used a heck, uh, an aniline dye pencil or uh, or ink to um, transfer writing from a paper original to the gelatin pad, and then you could make about 40 copies by pressing paper back onto the pad. That gave way to another um, mechanized version of hectography, which was the spirit duplicator, better known as the ditto machine. And for a lot of us who grew up before the 90s when uh, Xerox machines or photocopiers really took over, the ditto was the primary tool for American school teachers to print their assignments and handouts. It was called a spirit duplicator because it used an alcohol-based transfer fluid to carry the aniline ink from the master to the um, to the paper. And a lot of times when they were, the copies were freshly printed uh, they were damp and had a very sweet sort of alcohol smell that was famous and often remembered by students of a certain age. Uh, in fact it was immortalized in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High in a clip where Mr. Hand passes out the assignments and all the students in the class immediately take a big sniff. Although the purple copies that came off a ditto machine instill a certain nostalgia in people, it's really not a laughing matter because the transfer fluid was quite dangerous. Uh, the fumes were shown to create some pretty serious health effects for uh, particularly among teachers' aides uh, in studies that were done in the 70s and 80s. So um, it's kind of a good thing that we don't use this technology anymore, but uh, for those of us who have experimented with spirit duplication, it's actually possible to make a transfer fluid that doesn't use the nasty chemicals anymore. But I digress. Okay, let's get back to the mimeograph revolution. So we know that pre-digital office copiers like the mimeograph, spirit duplicator, and hectograph freed these 60s radical artists and writers from the constraints of the publishing industry and basically brought the power of the printing press to the people. But they weren't the first to use cheap copying technology to produce what we call democratic multiples. These radical underground publishers may have taken their model from an unlikely source, that being science fiction fandom. These mostly blue-collar, mostly teenage fans of far-fetched adventure stories had been creating an international network of amateur fanzines since well before World War II. Where did these fans draw their influences? Undoubtedly, they were imitating cheaply printed monthly pulp magazines with titles like Amazing Stories and Weird Tales. But also in the zeitgeist of the new industrial age were the seeds of political, cultural, and artistic revolt. Self-published chapbooks, underground comics, flyers, and fanzines all served as proving grounds for many of the 20th century's most influential creators. However, the mimeograph re revolution remains mostly unexamined artistic movement considered by many to be the realm of lowbrow or outsider amateurs unworthy of serious research. But a closer look at the work of many of the copier, copier artists reveals a high level of technical sophistication and profound social commentary. The works featured in this exhibit hopefully introduce viewers to the vibrant American amateur press scene of the early 20th century and also to some of the media that influenced it. This movement played an essential role in the development of pop culture genres like science fiction, comic books, and rock and roll, but also avant-garde art movements like fluxus, pop art, and concrete poetry. These highbrow artists and writers and lowbrow outs outsider zine publishers 
wrote a common sine wave through the 20th century using the cheap information technology of the era to create the images that define their generations and influence those to come. Unfortunately, I won't have time to show you every piece in the show, and I hesitate to call these the highlights because there are so many great pieces in the show. Every one is my favorite. But I will uh, show you a cross-section, let's say, of the pieces in the show. The first work we'll look at is Tournier Poetov, Tournament of Poets, by Alexei Kruchenik, with illustrations by Kirill Stanevich. Tournament of Poets is the result of what apparently was a sort of parlor game played by the Russian futurists. They would get together and um, and write humorous takeoffs on each other's work. And this one is uh, focused on Kruchenik, who was considered by many to be one of the most radical of the Russian um, futurist poets. He uh, is credited with inventing Zaum poetry, which is sound poetry, uh, sort of akin to uh, what the artists of the Dada movement were doing. And this includes a wonderful portrait of Kruchenik by Zdenevich. And uh, this is a rec recent acquisition. I was actually able to acquire this especially for this show, and it will be added um, to the X collection. And you will be able to come in and take a closer look at it uh, anytime you like. The next piece I'd like to show you is X War Elegies by William Everson. It's considered to be the first publication of the mimeograph revolution. Everson wrote the poems and published the book in 1942 while he was serving in a conscientious objector camp in Waldport, Oregon. He printed it on the camp's mimeograph machine and University of Iowa Special Collections is fortunate to have one of the few copies still in existence. Uh, it's an extremely fragile um, publication. It was printed on cheap pulp paper, but the typesetting and the artwork is pretty amazing. And Everson went on to be a letterpress printer and a fine press publisher um, of some considerable reputation. Bruce Yerke's The Damn Thing is on display, but it's also something that you can look at on the Iowa Digital Archive. It's a fan take on conscientious objectors, and you can see here on the cover Yerke depicts himself uh, being marched off to a conscientious objector camp, or the rest home for conscientious objectors. And you can see along with him in line is Bradbury, which is Ray Bradbury, who was in his 20s at the time. You can see all of the pages of the damn thing on the Iowa Digital Archive. Next, let's look at something from the world of fandom. This is Fan Magazine, a special feature on how to print a fan magazine by Walt Doherty. Obviously, Doherty was uh, looking for, to create a very professional product. He uh, has information on letterpress printing, mimeograph, and other types of printing in his guidebook. And one of the interesting things about it is that his book also includes an essay by Carol Coleman. And for those of you who don't know Carol Coleman, he was a typographer who came to the University of Iowa in 1946, the same year that this publication uh, came out, and he established the Typography Laboratory at the School of Journalism, which later became 
the University of Iowa Center for the Book. Uh, so this shows a very close connection between the origins of uh, the fanzine and the origins of the fine art press. Another interesting illustration of the intersection between fandom and fanzines and the literary small press is this pairing. On the right is Allen Ginsberg's Wichita Vortex Sutra. It's not a mimeograph or a hectograph. It's probably offset printed. Um, but Ginsberg was inspired to write this on a cross-country drive. He stopped in Wichita, which was one of the oases of beatnik culture um, for those who were crossing from New York to San Francisco. Ginsburg heard about the Wichita Vortex, which was actually a legend concocted by some Wichita area science fiction fans, including the Streif brothers who put out the Martian newsletter. Uh, Lee Streif later went on to become a poet himself and an active member of the Wichita uh, poetry and literary scene. So it's just another illustration of the cross-pollination that was happening between uh, science fiction fandom and the literary press. Next up is Snide, the Thud and Blunder Mag. This is by Damon Knight. Damon Knight was a member of the Futurian Science Fiction Club in New York City, which included Isaac Asimov, um, Donald A. Waldheim, Judith Merrill, and a number of other people who went on to become famous science fiction writers and editors. And you can see that the hectograph work in uh, Snide is exceptional. Even though it's faded, uh, you can see the quality of Knight's artwork. Um, this is due in part to the fact that he was trained uh, in the WPA poster project and learned to do silkscreen and uh, probably silkscreened the cover. Um, it's got multicolored hectographs and just exceptional artwork and um, it's really uh, head and shoulders above a lot of other fanzines. Another item that's on display but is also available on the Iowa Digital Library is this Chicano Heritage coloring book from the mid-70s. Uh, it was put out by a Latinx student organization um, at the time and it had mimeograph covers but what we have is actually the spirit duplicator master sheets. Um, they've been reversed so that you can read them but the originals uh, are reversed because they were uh, the printing matrices um, for the spirit duplicator machine. Unfortunately we don't know who did the artwork but it's pretty amazing and the scans that are available on the digital library are really quite good. You can really get up close and personal uh, and see the details in the artwork. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that can see all the pages as you can see you can scroll through you can bring up any page and uh, take a look at the details it's uh, quite an extensive educational guide besides being a coloring book and it looks like my time is about up so I'd just like to share a montage of some of the pieces in the show that I didn't get a chance to talk about. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and if you're in the Iowa City area during July and August of 2021 I would encourage you and invite you to come up and have a look for yourself. Thanks for watching. I'm Rich Dana from the University of Iowa Special Collections.